to me, <clears throat> when you're thinking about what's preventing people from seeing the obvious, it's propaganda. And then the next question is then, why don't we just get people to not to stop point it out? It's because it's not easy to spot. And people just think that propaganda is just simply lying about stuff. It's not. There's a whole lot of science, a whole lot of development of, of American propaganda, a hundred years to do this. So so let's let's listen and and discuss this. Uh, let me okay, here's the right one. So let's get started. <laughs> It's been estimated that an average American living in cities sees up to 4,000 ads a day. Ads are everywhere you look. Subways, bus stops, billboards, magazines. This toxic culture of mindless consumption exploits our innermost insecurities and desires to meet impossible standards. The corporate PR machine is enormously successful due to a model created by a man named Edward Bernays nearly a century ago. Edward Bernays. In the concept of public relations, which is just another word for propaganda, that's something else. Um, the word propaganda became sort of dirty, and then they started using public public relations. That's where that word, that kind of fun of phrasing came from. So let's continue with this uh, great information. The nephew of Sigmund Freud, Bernays is considered the father of modern propaganda or public relations. Come to so like let me go. go back. I meant to hit the pause button, so my bad. Um, In Europe. So you, you heard yeah. right. He's the nephew of Sigmund Freud. The nephew. So you heard right. So the great, uh, what is he, a psychologist or something like that? Um the nephew of him. So let's listen some more. Mostly successful due to a model created by a man named Edward Bernays nearly a century ago. The nephew of Sigmund Freud, Bernays is considered the father of modern propaganda or public relations. An Austrian aristocrat, Bernays's first contribution to the United States was helping President Woodrow Wilson sell the idea of World War I as a noble mission to spread democracy in Europe. In order to create the engineering of consent, Bernays argued, you must appeal to the unconscious mind. This is what people who think, oh, I'm just going to spot the propaganda. I'm just going to watch MSNBC and spot the propaganda. And that's it. I'm good. So I can watch it and not be affected. That's not what you're that's not it at all. Any sort of good propaganda you can't spot. That's what makes it good propaganda. So let's go ahead and. And on behalf of numerous corporate clients, Bernays helped perfect the tools of manipulation and conditioning that are used today. To understand more about the history of propaganda and the collusion between the U.S. Empire and Fourth Estate, I talked to professor of media studies at New York University, Mark Crispin Miller, who wrote the intro to the new edition of Bernays' 1928 seminal book, Propaganda. When did public opinion begin to stand out as a force to be managed by the establishment? For all intents and purposes, I think it's probably uh, most accurate to say that World War I marked an important turning point in uh, the rise of uh, what we call public opinion as a consideration uh, for political leaders. And, the and this also ties into polls, the propaganda to convince you and then they poll you. This is the reason why I always say polls are more to gauge the effectiveness of propaganda than it is to tell what people really think. So let me say that again. Polls are really, really just a gauge of the effectiveness of propaganda. 
So you can tell me a poll. Well, uh, look at this poll. 70% of people are against defund the police. That doesn't tell me anything because you're telling me that 70% of people that have been brainwashed say this. That's how I look at it. Let's continue. The, the science of, of propaganda, uh, which was used and has been used with increasing sophistication to um, move public opinion in certain directions, uh, basically to make sure that we don't uh, succumb to anything like real democracy. You know, I mean, public opinion has to be right. The ruling class, the thing they fear most is real democracy. That's what they fear the most is real democracy because that means they will not have the power they have. Let's continue. Be respected, but not out of any respect for the popular will. It has to be respected as, as, as a, a kind of... This point here is important, so I'm going to rewind it right there. Opinion has to be respected. Looks like I need to go back some more. Which was used and has been used with increasing sophistication to um, move public opinion in certain directions, uh, basically to make sure that we don't uh, succumb to anything like real democracy. You know, I mean, public opinion has to be respected, but not out of any respect for the popular will. It has to be respected as, as, as a, a kind of mighty beast that needs to be tamed uh, unless democracy uh, break out and upset the apple cart. In the introduction you wrote to Bernays' book, Propaganda, you said his aim was not to urge the buyer to demand the product now, but to transform the buyer's very world so that the product must appear to be desirable as if without the prod of salesmanship. Talk about how this strategy has been institutionalized. What, what Bernays understood uh, brilliantly was, was the need to kind of shape uh, the, the flow of events to influence the media in a general way, to create an atmosphere in which... You see this in mainstream media, the war propaganda right now. The bombardment of this. Look, look what's happening over here. Look at this, what they're doing over here. It's to create an atmosphere for you. To go, are you okay with us? Your bills, your gas going up? To create an atmosphere. because. Of course, you're okay with that when you see what's happening over there. You get what I'm saying? So it creates, they're not coming out and telling you, you should care about this more than that. They just show you a bunch of stuff that creates an atmosphere. So let's continue here. Oh, here it goes. Let's try this. Which uh, large numbers of people would end up making certain choices, uh, coming to certain conclusions without really being aware of any stimulus, you see. So he had a lot of contempt for advertising because it was too explicit. It was too blatant. It was, say, it was saying, buy this. I mean, it wasn't quite as simplistic as he made it sound. He badmouthed advertising and disdained it in favor of his own method. It was to kind of create the climate in which people would do certain things to benefit his clients. Uh, my Create the climate. Create the climate. Interject drugs into a community, suppress it economically. Underfund the schools. And then this is where the propaganda that creates the climate. You got NYPD Blue. You got on every newscast, this person murdered, that person murdered. You're creating a climate. So, you know, propaganda is not just specifically lying in a sentence. It's creating... Uh, the atmosphere for the person to go down the road you want them to go down. 
that's very, to me, very, very important. Very important. So let's continue here. My favorite example is that, you know, he, he, he represented a, p- a piano company. How to get people to buy pianos? Well, he did this by creating a craze for music rooms in homes, right? He actually contacted people in the architectural magazines and so on, and in the news media, uh, people who wrote about lifestyle and so on. They didn't use that term then. In order to create a kind of trend for music rooms. Okay, well, you have a music room. What are you going to put in it? I mean, obviously, most uh, you know, middle and upper middle class people want to buy pianos, you see. So even though he never mentioned the name of the piano company, and didn't even harp on pianos per se in the propaganda. It had the the general net effect of in, of getting people to buy more pianos, so the client was happy. Uh, he he had you know a contract to help increase sales for American tobacco, and one of the most important things that he did to that end was to uh, get Hollywood to incorporate this this right here. Let's. Go back to this part. The incorporation of Hollywood into propaganda schemes. Of, an, of getting people to buy more pianos. So the client was happy. Listen to this uh, one. He, he had you know, a contract to help increase sales for American tobacco. And one of the most important things that he did to that end was to uh, get Hollywood to incorporate cigarette smoking much more consciously and, and often artfully. That's artful propaganda. Hits up Hollywood. Hey, here's a little dough for you. Can you, you know, write into the script? Not just a, not just a nonchalant. Here's a cigarette. Like write into the script. Specifically, they're taking out a cigarette, and you notice you see these black and white shows. This is a picture of one where it's literally just elegance. Like it, the cigarette is just. So propaganda is like infusing things into culture also. It's like infusing the your criminality of black men into culture. Through movies, through television, through news broadcasts. If you put on every day, if there's... If there's a hundred, this is just an, a, a hypothetical example. If there's a hundred, if there's a thousand murders in the United States a year, and a hundred of those murders are done by black men, but the other 900 aren't, right? But let's say of your hundred newscasts on murder victims, you put on 75, 75 of the hundred black men. Even though there's 900 other, guess what that creates? That creates the belief that black men are the natural criminals, that black men are the ones to fear because you put them on more often, even though they're the smaller number. So, um, but this cigarette ad, the w- w- this example here, to me, also brings in Hollywood and how Hollywood is used to propagandize us, especially military propaganda, especially war propaganda. Into the scenarios of of movies, you know, to, to get them to write cigarette smoking, lighting up and so on to write all that into the stories, you see? So it, it developed a kind of, uh, you know, grammar of, you know, seduction and, you know, you could express various kinds of emotions with cigarettes, depending on, you know, uh, who lit you up or, or whatever. But the point I'm trying to make is that he, he understood that the inexplicit, uh, uh, the kind, kind of inexplicit influence, you know, uh, just creating a large scale uh, a shift in the weather, you know, to get people to do certain things. That was his great, uh, his great insight, you see. And, and now you ask, how did that, uh, how did that come to 
define our world, basically? Mm -hmm. Well, um, let, let me answer that question by stepping back mm -hmm. to say that I think that we live at a moment when propaganda has never been so pervasive, has never been so uh, influential, has never been so uh, dangerous. And I mean propaganda. I know that the word sounds terribly quaint. I say propaganda, people think of, uh, you know, Chinese voices coming, mm -hmm. squawking over loudspeakers. And yes, that's what I was trying to point out. They're, they're thinking of something that's so obvious, <laughs> like blatant just lies, you know? That's just lies. <laughs> Propaganda is so much more sinister, is so much more unconscious. In, in Beijing, or they think of Soviet posters, right? Or Nazi propaganda. They think of Lenny Riefenstahl. Uh, actually, uh, propaganda is not a totalitarian phenomenon primarily, although we, we have long since learned to think that it is, right? Propaganda is as American as apple pie. Propaganda at its most sophisticated was perfected. And I mean, not just political propaganda, but commercial propaganda. Both kinds of propaganda were perfected jointly by the United States and Britain. You know, in Mein Kampf, Hitler in his famous chapter on war propaganda talks about how deeply he admired what a brilliant job the British propagandists had done in World War I, had nothing but contempt for the German propaganda. And, and you know, resolve to make sure that his own and the Nazi party's propaganda would be brilliant in imitation of the British, you see? So I'm going to go back to one of those pictures to just point out something here. I hope I don't have to go back too far. I think it's right here. Place. Although we, we have long since learned to think that it is, right? Propaganda is as American as apple pie. Propaganda at its most sophisticated was perfected. And I mean, not just political propaganda, but commercial propaganda. Both kinds of propaganda were perfected jointly by the United States and Britain. You know, in Mein Kampf, Hitler in his famous chapter on war propaganda talks about how deeply he admired what a brilliant job the British propaganda. This poster, women of Britain said go. So this is like they're trying to propagandize men to join the military. <laughs> if a hot woman says go, if your woman says go. It, it's so so this infuses it in culture here. Propagandists had done in World War One had nothing but contempt for the German propaganda. And, and you know, resolve to make sure that his own and the Nazi party's propaganda would be brilliant in imitation of the British, you see? So, you know, uh, how, how many people does the world of propaganda employ in the United States, if you think about it? I mean, it isn't only people in public relations, it's also people in advertising agencies. It's also people in the world of so-called public diplomacy. It's also people in the world of what we call lobbying. There are countless euphemisms that we use today mm -hmm. for propaganda, right? If you go up to a person in an ad agency or a PR specialist and say, well, uh, how's the propaganda going? You know, they're gonna be insulted. They're gonna feel like you've, you've called them a dirty name. They don't understand that they do propaganda, right? They do propaganda. And the rise of all those euphemisms for it is a direct result of the successful effort to cast propaganda as something that they do in those closed societies. The Russians do it, the Chinese do it, the Iranians do it, the Venezuelans do it, the Cubans do it. We don't do it. We educate people. <laughs> we provide them with information. And that uh, misrepresentation of propaganda. Americans really do believe that. Oh, we don't do propaganda, just everybody else. There's, there's, I've heard that many times. So let's continue. Let's see how much we can get through here. Propaganda has had the paradoxical effect of making it extraordinarily effective. 
see, because propaganda works best when you don't see it for what it is. The level of sophistication is completely unreal. And it's not just people being aware of the propaganda and commercialism coming at them, tens of thousands of advertisements every day and being able to tune them out. <clears throat> it's things beyond that, the implants within the propaganda. Talk about that, the layers. That's a good point. I mean, first of all, I want to say people tend to pride themselves on not falling for propaganda. Here we go, people right say, here. You know, uh, I, commercials don't work on me. You know, I can see through them. And there are, there are a number of ad campaigns that have successfully appealed to that idea, you know, the kind of winking, ironic advertising. It and you share a little, a little chuckle or a little smirk over the fact that you're too smart to fall for this, right? This is kind of a postmodern move that advertising makes. Well, it's been making it in various ways really since the 30s, okay? People don't understand that even if they consciously scorn a particular ad as cheesy or they tell themselves they don't really believe the claims, that has nothing to do with what they'll end up buying if they happen right. to be thirsty and they go into a store somewhere. But, you know, let's, let's move away from the world of what they call white propaganda, which is to say propaganda that announces itself as propaganda. That's TV commercials, political speeches, stuff like that, you know. And let's move into the world of what we call gray propaganda, which is propaganda that disguises itself as journalism or, uh, you know, any number of dodges and disguises that propaganda puts on, right? Right. And actually, he's going to bring it up. I, I won't give it away. Product placement in movies is a form of gray propaganda, you know, and then a movie like Argo, for example, or Zero Dark Thirty, to move to more sinister examples, are, are movies that have a kind of geopolitical agenda uh, that are, uh, you know, making a case for very powerful interests within the state. Uh, movies that the CIA has actually uh, helped the producers uh, make, you know. And let's talk about what's behind the propaganda. Bernays is quoted as saying, we are governed, our minds are molded, our tastes formed, our ideas suggested, largely by men. So this is the part, listen to this, where they, they say it. So listen to this part that's coming up. Uh, she's going to read a sort of a long quote. Um, here we go. Propaganda. Bernays is quoted as saying, we are governed, our minds are molded, our tastes formed, our ideas suggested, largely by men we've never heard of. Who are the invisible governors that are controlling these ideas? Yeah, well, it, it, it's important to note that Bernays didn't think of that as a bad thing. Yeah. Right. He didn't think of that as a bad thing. Now, see, let's see why he didn't think of that as a bad thing. <laughs> you know, the heroic elite. Yeah, he thought that was a good thing because his assumption was that these um, august figures, these mighty uh, figures in the world's business and politics and the media uh, were essentially benign. He, he actually believed that. He thought there was a, a kind of rationality operating up top, you know, uh, which, you know, as I point out in my own introduction to the new edition of propaganda is a groundless claim. Uh, because often people who devote themselves to propaganda end up believing it themselves. You know, uh, if you have a vested interest in a particular version of the truth, you're going to believe it. It goes. Does that sound like our corporate media? If you keep pushing propaganda, then you start to believe propaganda. to just here we are today where 90% of what Americans see here and read is controlled by six corporations, six giant umbrella corporations. How? How does this function? You, you've called it a cartel because it seems like every single outlet echoes the exact same narrative and pro-U.S. bias. Yes, that's right. You know, um, for a long time, I used to think that what's happened to the media is entirely a matter of, uh, you know, runaway deregulation, uh, too much concentration of power, you know, too few independent. One of those is gone. I think, is it GE that sold everything? I can't remember because I, I think it's down to five. Let me see. Or it could be this one here. Time Warner Merge with one of these groups. But anyway, uh, I think it's down to five now. Independent voices, 
uh, too little broadcast regulation and so on. And I, I think that that has a great deal to do with it. But I, I, I now realize that there, there's, there's another factor that has to be considered as well. And that is the um, energetic involvement of, of the covert side of our own government in, in the news mm-hmm. and entertainment business. Countless people within the media are either wittingly involved with, you know, our intelligence agencies, mm. uh, you know, which is something that started to be exposed in the 70s with the congressional hearings, not just the CIA, but the FBI as well. I thought that it was a matter of uh, real concern that planted stories intended to serve a national purpose abroad um, came home and were circulated here and believed here because uh, this would mean that the CIA could manipulate the news in the United States by channeling it through some foreign country. Do you have Mm -hmm. any people being paid by the CIA who are contributing to a major circulation American journal. We do have people who submit pieces to other to American journals. Do you have any people paid by the CIA who are working for television networks? This, I think, gets into the kind of uh, getting into the details, Mr. Chairman, that I'd like to get into an executive session. That's a yes to that question. Anything then a no is a yes, especially when your response is, let me answer that question in a private session. There's no need to answer it privately, privately if the answer is no. This is decades ago. You don't think they perfected this even better? This is literally in the 70s. So we're talking 50 years. I just have to hear this again. Let's listen to this this, uh, historical video here where they're talking about the CIA and FBI planting stories in people in the press where there's print press or television news. In the 70s with the congressional hearings, not just the CIA, but the FBI as well. I thought that it was a matter of uh, real concern that planted stories intended to serve a national purpose abroad um, came home and were circulated here and believed here because uh, this would mean that the CIA could manipulate the news in the United States by channeling it through some foreign country. Do you have any people being paid by the CIA who are contributing to a major circulation American journal? We do have people who submit pieces to other to American journals. So um, here's this piece on Joe Biden from the CIA. Uh, New, New York Times here, put that in there. Then it comes out as this person wrote this when the CIA wrote that. This shit, man, I feel like I can go another hour on this shit, but we're going to be wrapping up maybe 15 minutes here. But this, <laughs> let's listen to the rest. So he, he asked about the print, and then he says something. Then as he's asked, he's going to the next part, which is t- television, broadcast news, he whispers in the ear of somebody, either somebody part of the CIA or an attorney, was saying, motherfucker, you need to stop answering these motherfuckers' questions out here. I don't know what the fuck your problem is, but this should be in closed session. We do have people who submit pieces to other to American journals. 
Do you have any people paid by the CIA who are working for television networks? This, I think, gets into the kind of uh, getting into the details, Mr. Chairman, that I'd like to get into an executive session. But then there are also a lot of people who are, uh, you know. What are your thoughts on that video? What are your thoughts on that video? I mean, that snippet there. What are your thoughts on that part from the uh, the House intelligence hearings? I think that's what that said. Or the intelligence hearings from the 19, 1975, where you have members of, you know, the alphabet group, CIA, FBI, on camera admitting at least to both to me that's an admission on both that they have people so if they had people in 1975 or in the 70s do you think they have people now do you think the cia has a story or has a way they want to go the world the the nation to go so they drop these news stories to the media and the media just regurgitates it. And now that becomes fact into our culture. You know, manipulated in traditional ways. Uh, you know, they have sources inside the government who will give them certain tips, give them certain stories, and they end up becoming dependent on those sources for that kind of information. They break really big stories and so on. And then they, I think without even knowing it, end up carrying water for uh, those agencies. You can hire people, you can actually pay them, you can have them under contract, right? Which is chilling and wrong in a democracy for the government to be paying people who are supposed to be providing the public with news to uh, you know, right. basically insert state propaganda into that news, it's wrong. But it's, it's only one way of many in which the press and often uh, the entertainment industries Entertainment uh, end industry up reflecting, you know, uh, serving the agenda of, of of the state and and very very powerful corporations. How else to explain the bizarre unanimity that we notice today uh, of the press on certain stories right. that they somehow managed to get absolutely wrong over and over and over and over. I mean, I. So the point he's making is, how is it that we're having news organization who's supposedly doing news, but all of them are getting the same exact stories wrong? Unless they have the same exact FBI, CIA contact. Let's continue. And I've been around for a long time studying the media in this country for decades. I've really never seen anything like this. There's an Alice in Wonderland quality to it because we live in a, a country that prides itself on freedom of expression and the marketplace of ideas. And yet we see over and over and over and over again on issue after issue, there's a certain, a certain truth that is enforced with, with uh, exactly the same kind of, of, of ruthlessness and impatience with any disagreement that you'll find in, in countries like North Korea. It's not like it's some big conspiracy theory where there's just a hundred guys in a room smoking, figuring out here, we're gonna pull this on this news agency, Fox is gonna air this. The interlocking boards of directorates, the sponsorship, the right. consumer advertising, especially when it comes to pharmaceutical agencies, how would you say it works? Is it just a machine functioning on its own and people? Are I'm going to pause this video here and bring up Norm's, I'm sorry, Nam's video. It's a lot shorter. It's probably about two minutes of his video that we're going to watch. I got, to, be well. I got to get off of here soon because uh got to make breakfast and got to get my girls to school. So, yeah. Let's get into, I think it's somewhere around here. Which was established in order to try to drive a basically pacifist population uh, into support for the war that uh, 
Wilson very much. Actually, hang on a second. And was for almost 100 years connected with, very powerfully, the public affairs um, work of um, the American Tobacco Company. Um, okay. Working with. It's Clark this question. So let me play it. She asked a question about the person, Edward Bernays, and uh, and uh, her, him writing about uh, him. And your love of linguistics. I was just curious if you ever had the opportunity to have any connection with Mr. Edward L. Bernays, who was a resident of Cambridge for the last 40 years of his life, was first in New York City, and was for almost 100 years connected with, very powerfully, the public affairs um, work of um, the American Tobacco Company, um, working with Guatemala for a, uh, a war that almost was started because of bananas uh, in the 50s, and all of these different media um, actions that I believe have really contributed to where we are now in our, our worldview of we have got a corporate mentality of destroying what we don't like, uh, taking it over, manipulation of it, because his luring from his uncle, Sigmund Freud, was utilized to his best ability with twisting people's view of what was good for them so that he could sell products to them. Thanks, caller. Eddie Bernays. Uh, actually, I never, you're right, he lived in Cambridge. We weren't that far apart. I never actually met him. But, Called the uh, father of public relations. Yeah, but I've, I've written a fair amount. I, I've looked a lot at a lot of his work and, in fact, have written a fair amount about it. Uh, I suspect that it wasn't his uh, Freud who was the big influence on him, but rather, uh, in fact, exactly what he said. He said the major influence on him was his participation uh, in the first state propaganda agency in the United States, uh, Woodrow Wilson's Committee on Public Information, which was... Woodrow Wilson's Committee on Public Information. Public information, you would think, oh, that's just information. No, that's the propaganda wing. ...was established in order to try to drive a basically pacifist population. Uh, into support for the war that uh, Wilson very much wanted to get into in uh, in Europe. And it succeeded. Uh, within a short period of time, the propaganda efforts, they were called propaganda in those days. It was more honest use of terminology. The propaganda efforts of the Committee on Public Information, a very Orwellian name, uh, was... Uh, uh, did succeed in driving a pacifist population into uh, raving uh, mm -hmm. anti-German fanatics, you know, to the point where um, the Boston Symphony Orchestra couldn't play uh, Beethoven and things like that. Uh, it drove the country into a kind of hysteria. And the participants in that uh, committee included many people of uh, subsequent great uh, distinction and influence. Edward Bernays was one. Another was Walter Lippmann, the leading public intellectual of the 20th century and most important figure in American media. Uh, both of them uh, went through the, that experience and learned from it uh, and wrote about what they learned from it. What they learned, as uh, Bernays put it in his a famous book of his called Propaganda, late 1920s, I think, uh, he said that we have learned that uh, the intelligent minorities uh, can uh, engineer consent through the use of uh, uh, manipulation. Prop Intelligent minorities. This is the part I've been playing this whole video for this section right here. Listen to this. Minorities. Uh, Let me go back a little bit more. I never go back enough always. A famous book of his called Propaganda, late 1920s, I think. Uh, he said that we have learned that uh, the intelligent minorities can uh, engineer consent through the use of uh, uh, manipulation, propaganda, and uh, control. And we should do it for the benefit of the public. It's for the benefit of the public that we should control them and engineer their... This is what they believe. This is what 
the ruling class believe, the Bill Gates, the Michael Bloombergs, they really believe there's some sort of small minority of elite thinkers, people who should be running the country and making the decisions. And they just have to convince all of the dumb people of the right choices. And you do that through manipulation. Let me see if we play that one more time. The late 1920s, I think. Uh, he said that we have learned that uh, the intelligent minorities uh, can uh, engineer consent through the use of uh, uh, manipulation, propaganda, and uh, control. And we should do it for the benefit of the public. It's for the benefit of the public that we should control them and engineer their consent. Uh, Lippmann said pretty much the same thing. Also drawing from the experience of the wartime propaganda agency, uh, he wrote uh, significant, important essays on democracy in the 1920s called Progressive Essays in Democracy. They were both uh, liberals, kind of Wilsonian progressives. Uh, he said, well, we've learned that uh, there's a new art in the practice of democracy, uh, the art of what he called manufacturing consent. Bernays' term was engineering of consent. And this is very significant uh, because the public uh, should not be participants in the democratic process. They should be spectators, not participants. They are uh, ignorant and meddlesome outsiders, as he put it, and for their own benefit, you hear this stuff here? Like, I can literally do another show on just this video and some of these comments that he's saying from uh, Edward Bernays. But democracy is not for us. The peasants, it's too, it's too intellectually, it's above your pedigree. Let us take care of that. Just, just, just follow along essays in democracy. They were both uh, liberals, kind of Wilsonian progressives. Uh, he said, that, well, we've learned that uh, there's a new art in the practice of democracy, uh, the art of what he called manufacturing consent. Bernays' term was engineering of consent. And this is very significant uh, because the public uh, should not be participants in the democratic process. They should be spectators, not participants. They are uh, ignorant and meddlesome outsiders, as he put it. And for their own benefit, uh, we, the intelligent minority, the responsible men, uh, must control them. Uh, Bernays's particular... This is, this is, this is the, the Hillary Clintons, like I said, the Bill Gates, the Michael Bloombergs, the Jeff Bezos, the... Uh, uh, what's the one with the... Sinister laugh from Facebook, that guy, Mark Zuckerberg. They think they're this small minority of people that is so intelligent that they should be making and leading the country. Think about Davos, the meeting in Davos of all the uh, uh, countries and what their, what their plan for all of us in the future. Let me... Let me rewind. So my wife and kids are up now. And my wife has on an outfit that she's signaling to me for something. What? Yes. <laughs> yes, you're signaling something. <laughs> you're signaling to me for something. So I got I got the signal here. I don't know why you sniggling and giggling over there. <laughs> All right, so let's continue here. They are uh, ignorant and meddlesome. Out Actually, I'm going to rewind because these two sections where he's 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 uh, paraphrasing or summarizing um, what uh, Edward Bernays has said is astonishing. This is back. You got to understand how why they're so open with this is because back when they thought propaganda wasn't a bad thing, even the use of the word. 
also drawing from the experience of the wartime propaganda agency, uh, he wrote uh, significant, important essays on democracy in the 1920s called Progressive Essays in Democracy. They were both uh, liberals, kind of Wilsonian progressives. Uh, he said, well, we've learned that uh, there's a new art in the practice of democracy, uh, the art of what he called manufacturing consent. Bernays' term was engineering of consent. And this is very significant. Uh, because the public uh, should not be participants in the democratic process. They should be spectators, not participants. They are uh, ignorant and meddlesome outsiders, as he put it. And for their own benefit, uh, we the... In he said he put it. They're ignorant and meddlesome outsiders. Outsiders of de dem uh, democracy. We're outsiders of democracy. This is the thinking of the person who have constructed the way our propaganda style in America.